March 25th, 1976.
this is uh, this is it's like ball players. Every time a ball player goes out to an ex ball player goes out to a ballpark and he sees somebody throw a big fat roundhouse pitch that gets away from him and hangs out over the plate, his palms itch. He wants to lean into it and put it over the scoreboard. We are going tonight to discuss raisins. No, no, not raisins. No, no. Although, by the way, worms do like uh, ground raisins. And the reason I brought this up is that I just, uh, a little note came out of, uh, I think it's the Wall Street Journal. Raising worms for a fisherman's bait is now a $1 billion a year business in the United States. $1 billion. That's big. Uh, sales at North American Bait Farms, that's a company, topped $100,000 last year and may reach 300000 this year. There are about 25 million licensed fishermen, etc. And they talk about, he says, we ship worms all over the U.S this guy. Well, you know, I could very well have been that I could have become, had I stuck with it, the tycoon who is running this business. Now, <laughs> I've known kids during their school time to do a lot of stuff to raise money. Uh, you know you know how you do. You, you get a job uh, mowing the lawn and stuff. This is when you're too young to get a, a, a work permit. Now, some kids just don't think in terms of ever earning any money. I mean, you don't. Uh, it's always been interesting to me, you know, that the, I think the country divides into two groups, the people who, you know, do it and the people who just sort of sit around, uh, you know, and wait for others to lay it on them. It's, uh, it's kind of a curious... Maybe it starts when you're a little tiny child. Really, yeah, I, I found that, that, that even grown-up people, when they get, when they get to, uh, as an adult, uh, they, they don't see themselves as actually going out there and hacking a a hole in the world, and, uh, you know, digging up the nuggets and uh, bringing home the potatoes. Uh, because I suppose there are some people who, from the very beginning of their life, have the potatoes brought to them, one form or another. And uh, they see life as essentially a taking proposition. Uh, other guys see life as essentially a struggle of getting a very different pro proposition, and uh, taking and getting. <laughs> it, it really is. And so ultimately, the guys that spend their time hacking out of the wilderness a small farm wind up by keeping the others alive, uh, you know, who squat down under the rocks and demand free potatoes. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the way it goes. So uh, as a kid, I was about 12, so, you know, I, I, uh, I love fishing. Fishing every spring. Uh, used to be the most really exciting time for me. This is the most exciting. In fact, it even to this day, uh, to me, spring is the most exciting time of the year, absolutely, without question, uh, because it's a new season. Uh, there are uh, unseen days ahead. There are summers and sunsets and sunrises that you have not yet experienced, and uh, it's an exciting time. And I used to get one of my great... One of my great gifts that I got as a kid from one of my from one of my uncles was a two year subscription to Field and Stream. Did you ever read Field and Stream? Well, <laughs> Field and Stream was really, in a sense, inspirational literature. <laughs> it didn't have much to do with reality, I'm afraid, but it was a, it was like a, some deeply religious person gets a, a weekly magazine that assures them that their religion is the best religion. And it uh, has all kinds of stories of great conversions in it. Uh, you've seen these magazines. Well, that's in a sense what Field and Stream was about. And usually at this time of year in the spring, like in April, and uh, very early April up uh, through the early part of May, they would all have, have pieces about, uh, that would begin, that would uh, have the first opening paragraph, would say, uh, My Indian guide, Joe, led the way through the tangled underbrush. Ahead, I could see the faint glimmer of sparkling blue water. The excitement was rising in my soul because I knew that I was about to experience that great dream of all bass fishermen. I was about to dip a line into a lake that had never been fished before in the history of man. An untouched bass lake lying like a diamond amid the great northwest woods <laughs> and, of course, five minutes later, he's, he's standing on the shore, 
and uh, he's looking out over this magnificent uh, stretch of water. His Indian guide, Joe, is squatting in the bushes beside him, and uh, they have carried their canoe to the banks, and he carefully selects a bass lure, which he ties onto his monofilament leader, and then he flicks a few, uh, few practice casts in the air, and then he lays his first cast out towards the lily pads, and the lure just touches the water. And as it touches the water, there is a great explosion. The water roars in the air. And, of course, I don't have to tell you the rest. He spends the afternoon uh, engaging in battle with ravenous bass so big that often they chase him right up on the shore to get into his tackle box to eat his lures. You know, uh, uh, spring does things to people's head. I, I've, uh, some people think in terms of buying a new car. <laughs> Every time spring comes, you know, wow. Uh, but uh, at this time of the year, uh, I, when I was, uh, well, maybe eight or nine or ten, I got hung on fishing, just fantastically hung on fishing. Uh, and, and it was almost all completely vicarious. You know, like kids here in the East often get hung on showbiz, and their great dream is to write a play or to become an actor, uh, you know, all the whole mystique of showbiz. Well, in the area where I lived, I think you get hung on the thing often that is least attainable to you. Uh, I'm sure that if you live uh, on a lake and from the time you were born, you live on this great lake that's filled with landlocked salmon and stuff, you don't get excited over the fishing season, really, because it's part of your life. You know, you just don't, don't think much about it. But uh, to people who have never known a thing uh, and they hear about it and they get sucked in by it, it's almost the madness. I'm sure that here, out here in, in New York, now there's a lot of people living in this area who have dreams of living in some mystical valley in Colorado where the sky is always brilliant and they're riding a quarter horse eternally. I don't think that people who, who live in those countries, that area, were ever impressed by Marlboro spots. I think that Marlboro commercials were directed to guys that live in Flatbush, <laughs> you know, they have, you know, a horse is something you see at a middle distance, and usually it's made out of bronze, and General Sherman is sitting on it, <laughs> and the pigeons are standing on the rump there. Uh, that's what a horse is. But occasionally you see one through the middle, uh, the middle bushes out there in, in uh, Central Park. That's about what a horse is. But a guy, you know, a guy that lives with horses all the time, hey, you know, it's a horse, it's a horse, by a natural way of living. And uh, he just accepts it. Well, I lived in a place where there was no, there were no waters that were fishable for like uh, God knows how many hundred miles. Uh, Indiana, in the northern Indiana part of the state where I grew up in, is just a big, vast sand plain. And the few rivers that cut through that part of the country were so polluted that at certain times of the year, and I mean in the middle of the summer generally, you could literally walk across them just a thick coating of coagulated kerosene. <laughs> and I mean it. In fact, they were so polluted. You think you see pollution? I want to tell you. I one time saw a river that was about a mile from my home, a big river, literally burst in the flames. And I'm serious. It burnt from, from horizon to horizon. Now, you've never seen the Hudson do that. You've never seen the East River do that. But our rivers were actually, uh, they had an octane rating. Uh, you could take a cup of that water and put it in your gas tank and probably get maybe 15, 20 miles at a gallon. <laughs> I mean, because all the refineries in that area poured all their cred in there. There was all kinds of leaks in the tanks and stuff, and it was just filled with oil and high-test uh, fly tox. You remember fly tox? You know what fly tox was, Jerry? Well, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-insect stuff. And they made fly tox about a mile from my home. Yeah, it's the stuff you sprayed out of a can. Fly tox. It was uh, anti-bugs. And this stuff used to get in the river. And it didn't do the perch any good, I can tell you that. <laughs> there were no perch. They were all hypothetical. So there, were no, there was no place to fish. Now, you're going to say Lake Michigan. Are you kidding? Fishing in Lake Michigan? For crying out loud. Come on. There wasn't a fish seen for 400 miles in Lake Michigan when I was a kid. <laughs> Pollution, man. Uh, the steel mills were pouring slag into Lake Michigan. 
and even the perch cannot take slag, red-hot slag, poured on his head. So uh, uh, the idea of fishing became to me kind of a mystical thing, and I used to read Boy's Life. I was in this Boy Scout troop, and uh, we, at one time we took a, we took a weekend uh, camporee. Did you ever have a camporee? That's what Boy Scouts do. Well, where did we take our camporee? Well, we took it in the tank farm at Phillips 66. What's a tank farm? Well, you know when you drive out here on the Jersey Turnpike, you see all those tanks? That's a tank farm. Well, we the only open space around where I was a kid was this tank farm. And so our, our uh, scoutmaster, Mr. Gordon, got permission from Philip 66 that we could camp in the, in, the, in the tank farm. So you could write home, you know, Dear Ma, we're having a lot of fun on the farm here. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, I, somehow... Reading Boy's Life and uh, and reading magazines that came my way, I heard about fishing. And uh, fishing seemed to me to be a really a fantastic uh, thing to do. I mean, just to go fishing. And uh, we used to every couple of uh, every couple of years, my old man would get his vacation fee, and we would go up to Southern Michigan. We would rent a cottage on the lake up there. And uh, of course, this was an orgy of going out on the lake to fish. Now, it just so happened, though, that the lake that we would always rent a cabin on had once known three or four fish. This was about the time of Buffalo Bill. Uh, but the time that we were there, it was nothing but one sea of motorboats. <laughs> motorboats pulling people at the end of ropes, standing on water skis. And, uh, you know, we'd be sitting out there in our rented rowboat waiting for one of the descendants of the four fish to come along. So we never really caught any fish. It was always just a thing you went to do. And the idea of actually catching fish, really, you know, big fish, fish that fought, was, uh, was just an, an idle dream. And so I'm about nine or ten, and this was before I got involved in electronics. So I, I, I developed a very strange hobby. I have never heard of another kid who actually did this. Now, there may be other kids who did it, but I never heard of them. I began to make in the basement out of segments of broomsticks. You know, the wooden broomsticks? We had a workbench down in the basement. And I began to make out of segments of broomsticks plugs, bass plugs. You ever hear of a kid actually doing that? You know, I took it for kind of granted. Now, looking back on it, I can see what an exotic hobby that was. And uh, I had catalogs. I would send for catalogs that I would see advertised in, uh, in say, Field and Stream. In the back, there would be a catalog from the South Bend Bait Company. <laughs> they make the Bassarino. They're exciting. I always wanted to own a real Bassarino. And uh, the Hedden Bait Company, H-E-D-D-O-N. You ever heard of them? The Hedden Bait Company. They made a thing called the, uh, uh, the River Runt. Uh, these were great classic baits. How many of you ever heard of the river runt? Any, any of you ever heard of the jointed pikey minnow? Ah, these are, these are great classics. These are classics like the, like the Packard and the Cadillac. These are still classic baits. The Bassarino, the pikey minnow, the Hawaiian wiggler. You ever heard of the Hawaiian wiggler? Great bait. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. So, so these were, the, and they'd have pictures of these things. So I had never actually seen the real thing because, you know, there was no bass in our neighborhood or anything. So when you'd go to the sporting goods store in our neighborhood, all they had things were, they had stuff like, uh, oh, uh, fielder's mitts, uh, softball bats. Softball was the big thing in the area. And there were thousands of softball bats. And uh, uh, stuff like uh, catcher's uh, masks and equipment of that type. But very little fishing equipment. And what fishing equipment they had was usually uh, way in the back someplace because there was very little fishing done around there. They'd have two or three rods thing. I'd go and look at the rods. <laughs> and they'd, they'd have a glass case, and you'd see the reels in there. Well, the, the, the Bassarino became a kind of a mystical bait to me because in all the stories, in Field and Stream, these guys would use a Bassarino, or they, or they would use a, uh, a river runt, or they would use a, uh, a Hawaiian wiggler, or they'd use a pikey minnow. They'd always mention these things. And so I sent away for these catalogs, which were free. And getting the South Bend Bait Catalog, which was a yearly catalog, which incidentally is still published, was a, you know, tremendous thing in the spring for me. Just 
fantastic. And I'd look through all the pictures of the rods, and they were in color. They'd have pictures of the baits, and you'd get them in three different sizes, the half-ounce size, the three-quarter-ounce size, the one-and-a-quarter-ounce size, a really big fish. Uh, and they had, they had stuff like a musky lures. Can you imagine the excitement of reading about a musk lunge lure? Do you know what a musky is? Well, the musky is a legendary fish, truly legendary. And the muskalunge is the full name of the fish. Uh, the muskalunge, and you can look it up in your dictionary. It's a great dictionary. M U S K musk e a m u s k e l u n g e. The muskalunge. This is a fish that lives in the northern climes of America, and it's quite rare, and it's big. He he will grow uh, to uh, approaching a hundred pounds. And he is voracious. Uh, he has huge teeth. <laughs> he is a fighter of fantastic uh, uh, strength. He's a beautiful fish. He's of the pike family. He's long and, and elegant. In fact, uh, the northern pike is often mistaken for the muskellunge. But uh, any real aficionado knows the difference immediately. And I'll tell you a little story about that. They'd have, like, in the, in the field and stream, there'd be a story about a guy floating through, a, uh, through a, a, a very, very provocative stretch of river in northern Wisconsin. They had great names for the rivers, too, like Eagle River. Wow. The Eagle River. These guys were always set out with their Indian guide. And uh, the second day, first day it was raining and nothing would happen. The second day they're floating in the shadows when suddenly the, the Indian guide is paddling the canoe when suddenly there's a great roar and this enormous fish, a muskellunge, would strike at the paddle. The paddle. And great teeth marks would be left on the, the paddle. And, the, and uh, the Indian would say, oh, oh, Big George, which would mean the legendary Big George, a fish which fishermen had been fishing for for over a hundred years, had just made his presence known by striking at the canoe paddle. A 200-pound muskie, uncatchable. <laughs> so smart that he he would uh, he, he not only could tell when a muskellunge lure was thrown at him, but he knew who made it. He knew what type it was, how much it cost. You're not going to get Big George, man. <laughs> and, yeah, and then, of course, the story would always be how, how this guy, uh, on his last day up in this great wilderness, tied on to Big George. And how Big George struck at this this uh, musky minnow that he was using, this artificial bait, and there was this tremendous roar as the fish hit, and uh, the, the, he sounded immediately. And then there's this titanic battle. Of course, at the end, he did not catch him. That uh, that his rod uh, or some piece of his his equipment exploded uh, with the tremendous power of this enormous fish. And uh, Big George once again was the victor. <laughs> and, and then he always ends, I vowed that I would come back, but in my heart I knew that I would never catch Big George because I knew that if I did catch Big George, it would be the end of a dream. Gee, man, wow, you need this kind of stuff, man. It brings the, the old things up in your ears. Uh, we have a commercial here to bring a few of the things up in your ears. <laughs> oh, what a come down. I, I just wonder how many of you guys ever had that hang-up when you were a kid. Uh, I, I admit this is a somewhat a self-indulgent and poetic uh, show uh, of a certain type, but when you're, when you're living in, a, in an area, I suppose, I suppose that most of us have an escape hatch. And when you're a kid, you don't recognize this as an escape hatch. Only now do I recognize that that's what it was for me, an escape hatch. Not because I felt uh, embattled or anything like that, because you don't when you're a kid, you know, you're just there, that's all. But uh, the idea of, of fishing for muskellunge in this lake uh, up in the northern Wisconsin, the North Woods, you know, you don't hear about that much out here. Did you ever hear the great North Woods much here? Does the word mean anything, the phrase mean anything to you, Jerry, the great North Woods? Have you ever heard the phrase? Do you know where they are? Well, from the time I was a kid, the words, the phrase, because this is the Midwest, 
the phrase the great north woods was always mentioned uh, when, when you talked about things like uh, vacations and, and uh, fishing and it was a, it was a country of great great mystery and the great north woods uh, if you're really interested in it is is up in the northern very northernmost stretches of Minnesota uh, that Canadian area up around the, the northern reaches of the Great Lakes and they are there if you think that that these don't exist anymore just last year I had a chance to go up uh, and I taught uh, a course in short story writing and creative uh, writing at uh, part of the University of Minnesota at Bemidji, Minnesota, which is right in the middle of Muskellunge country. And this is a, this is a legendary part of the world, by the way, uh, to, to a fisherman, Bemidji, Minnesota. But, you know, I, I want to I talk a little bit about this because this is spring, you know, and uh, in the springtime all over the Midwest, there are kids right now at this point that are vaguely dreaming of the day when they're going to be up in the North Woods. And the North Woods are truly impenetrable in many ways. Tremendous deer population. And there are, in fact, in the North Woods, hundreds and hundreds of lakes, thousands of lakes, that have rarely felt the foot of man on the shore. They are really not, not, uh, not touched. You've seen the uh, license plate of the state of Minnesota, haven't you? Well, I'll tell you what it is. If you haven't seen it, it says the land of 10,000 lakes. Do you know that this is actually an understatement? That the, that the state of Minnesota actually has roughly 11,500 genuine lakes. But that doesn't look good on the license plate. <laughs> so it's called the land of 10,000 lakes. And it really is. This is, uh, this is Hiawatha country, you know. Hiawatha is not uh, further west. It's Minnesota. In fact, they have a beer out there that the uh, beer commercial says, uh, comes from the waters of the Minnetonka. And you know what the Minnetonka was. Well, way up in that area, these, these people fish for these fantastic fish, the muscalunge. And uh, there are people... Well, I'll tell you what kind of a fish it is, that the, that the game laws say that the fish must be over 36 inches in length before you can keep it. That's a yard long... <laughs> before you can even keep it. That ain't even a keeper. You catch a fish that's uh, 35 inches long. That's a yard, you know. You throw them back in. And these babies are mean. They eat, for example, they eat ducks. Uh, they have been known to strike at people that are swimming. Yes, they're really something else. And extremely wily. Very, very difficult to catch. And I used to lay on the daybed in the early spring uh, in the shadow of the... Uh, Philip 66 tanks with the blast furnace uh, drifting dust down upon the wash lines of the backyards of our time. I'd lie there and read stories about great muscalunge lakes <laughs> where Indian guides knew where this fish would hide at certain times of the day. And you know that the muscalunge is a fish that stakes out an area of a lake or a, or a river, and this is his territory that a male muscalunge will occupy this area for maybe 50 years, and any intruder he will chase out. In fact, most muskies do not hit because they're hungry. They hit because this lure seems to be an intruder to them, intruding on their, their uh, range. Now, bam, they'll hit it, man. And uh, there are men who have gone fishing for muscalunge for upwards of 10 to 15 years without once having a strike. It's a very elusive fish, one of the great game fish of the world, uh, related to the northern pike, uh, related also to the pickerel, but only by family. <laughs> it's another story. It's like uh, King Kong was related, I suppose, to the chimpanzee, but they're only vaguely. <laughs> curious ghost under a 
under a willow tree with a heavy shadow just peering out at dawn. I can remember standing on a lake shore. You smell the reeds. You hear a few frogs that are just beginning to go to sleep. Frogs sleep in the day, you know, at dawn. And you see the steam rising from this placid water, curiously steel gray. And that feeling that I knew inside of myself, that this water you're looking at has muskies in it. There are muskellunge in this lake. And only a fisherman, only a true sportsman could understand that. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for them either. I just knew they were there. And that great blue heron just waded through the shadows looking like a strange, knock me ghost. Stay tuned for In Conversation.